Welcome to episode number 17 of Colorado TechCast. You know, I was getting into my 40s and I was pretty good in technology. I was doing pretty good, you know, kind of in my corporate career. However, I always knew that uh, there was a, like a higher calling for me. So I uh, started doing some due diligence as a good engineer should. I just realized like there really is an epidemic of unemployment within the blind, visually impaired community. It's just an epidemic. I actually started writing up the, the business case while I was still finishing up my stint there at uh, Level 3 Communications. I was uh, doing some skip levels with some of the executives there at Level 3, showcasing my overall idea. Uh, they were very encouraged by, you know, what I was attempting to put together, and uh, they told me to give it a shot, which is fantastic. It was, you know, great advice. And so 2012, uh, fourth quarter, I took the plunge, left a six-figure income to start BIT. Technology being the greatest mitigator for all of humanity, from the Wright brothers to the pencil. Uh, I wanted an organization that was solely focused on making an impact with this unemployment epidemic. On this episode, I have Mike Hess, who's the executive director and founder of the Blind Institute of Technology. The Blind Institute of Technology, or BIT as Mike calls it, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that really serves two missions. First, they work with employers, educating them about the advantages of hiring blind and visually impaired people. And second, they work with blind and visually impaired job seekers to prepare them with the skills they need to be successful in today's job market. But Mike wasn't always in this type of role. In fact, he has nearly two decades of experience in IT and telecom, doing everything from development to architecture work at leading telecom providers in Colorado. In 2013, he hung up his hat as an engineer and decided to follow his true calling, which was helping blind and visually impaired people find success in today's technology job markets and build thriving and successful careers just like he did. He understands the challenges that they face and the pushback that some employers may have about hiring blind and visually impaired people because Mike himself started going blind at age five. Now let's get started. Today I'm speaking with Mike Hess. Mike is the best looking blind guy out there and is also the founder of the Blind Institute of Technology. Mike, how are you doing today? Good, Trapper. Thanks so much for having me on, my friend. And uh, I appreciate the marketing campaign. Everywhere I go, I let them know that, hey, uh, just let people know you're talking to the best-looking blind guy out there. It's all about marketing, right? So thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. So, Mike, tell me about yourself. Sure thing. Uh, I was uh, born a poor white boy in Northeast Ohio, and that's there's a whole lot of truth to that. I actually thought spam was the fifth meat category. So I'm born uh, kind of... Uh, like to say to, you know, immigrant parents. However, I was raised by a single mom, you know, d- uh, doing her best to raise uh, two boys with uh, one. Uh, as, as she found out early on that I was going blind. And so she did her best to, um, you know, to raise us and keep us out of trouble. And in uh, 1985, we moved to uh, Colorado and uh, the school districts out here, uh, since they knew that I was uh, supposed to lose my eyesight by the time I turned 18, they got me into uh, blindness type training, uh, reading Braille, cane orientation mobility training, that sort of stuff. So to prepare me for obviously a life of uh, darkness. So I've been fortunate though that uh, my eyesight uh, never uh, has gone completely dark. I have a, a a condition called the cone rod dystrophy and essentially it's similar to we'll call it like a macular degeneration where you lose your central vision and then you lose uh, portions of your peripheral vision so I uh, with very very optimal lighting conditions I still get a little bit of shape and a little bit of color um, but uh, it's for the most part I um, you know, I always I describe my vision as like looking through um, a fishbowl and uh, a dark fishbowl at that. So I uh, <laughs> don't I don't get a ton of light or, or or shape or color, but I'm I'm blessed to have a little bit. So when did you start going blind? When did you notice that that you didn't have vision? Well, it's uh, kind of a again I'm I'm an old guy. So back in the '70s, the uh, Kind of the prerequisite just to get through kindergarten was just to be able to color in, you know, the big letter M or the big letter O, and I couldn't really color in the lines all that well, so they thought I was just delayed, and um, I always joke that I'm I'm a little slow, not that slow. However, it was first grade when they um, 
when they started doing the eye test where they said, you know, what color is closest, all that sort of thing. And that's when they realized, like, oh, my goodness, yeah, there's something going on with his peepers. Small town, northeast Ohio, went to the uh, local optometrist. Uh, they did not have the proper equipment, so they gave my mom a placebo pair of glasses and just said, you know, um, you know, essentially, you know, give this a shot. She knew within, you know, really hours, but a couple of days. So we went to the next town over, next town over, and ultimately ended up at the Cleveland Clinic, which is a um, highly recognized eye institute uh, globally. And uh, they did some experimental surgeries on me in the first grade and found out that what well, they diagnosed me with at the time they thought was the earliest onset of macular degeneration. And uh, so since then, they, you know, I've got a, a more updated uh, diagnosis. But um, they, uh, they had told my doctor, my mom, the doctors told her that, uh, yeah, your son is going blind and he'll lose all of his eyesight by the time he turns 18. So, um, in uh, much to, you know, like I can hardly imagine being um, a parent being told that uh, with your seven-year-old boy right there. And I, I looked up at my mom, Trapper, and I'm like, what is blind? And, uh, you know, she was, she had the strength of a lion. She just says, it just means you're going to be special. And mm -hmm. I, um, it still brings tears to my eyes to think like, you know, the courage that it would take, uh, for a parent to be so calm and yet so steady during uh, news like that is, uh, still phenomenal to me. So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can only imagine I've got, I've got three daughters of my own. I can only imagine trying to explain that to them. Uh, and what their future would look like. So, but it, it doesn't sound like you've let that, that slow you down at all. Right. Well, you know, it's it, my, uh, <laughs> I call it gently nudging, but my mom was, uh, you know, she uh, had a firm foot to tail. She's like, you're going to get your butt out there and you're going to live life. And, uh, yep, you're going to run into stuff and yep, you're going to fall down and yep, you're probably going to be picked on again. This is a uh, seventies, um, culture. So, mm -hmm. uh, the term bullying really wasn't a term until, we'll call it the last 10 years, you know, so back then it was, um, you know, almost survival of the fittest. And so being, uh, you know, being somebody who, like in class, they started doing large print books, all that, all that was, was a target, you know, they, it was a target in the uh, integrated school systems where, you know, um, boys, you know, blind boy, blind boy, all, all that kind of stuff was out there. Very, very common. And, uh, so I, you know, I, um, I'd say, I, you know, I was kind of toughened by some, um, you know, some tough lessons out there and, you know, my mom just, you know, again, firm foot to butt, she just kept telling me, get on out there and, you know, um, strongly encouraged and if not forced me to, you know, be on the wrestling team and track and get into karate and all those kind of things to, you know, not, not let it slow me down. And, um, uh, I, I was uh, very blessed to uh, with some athletic prowess, and so I was a pretty good athlete, and uh, so that kind of helped level the playing field a bit for me during uh, very formidable dating years in high school, that sort of thing. So at least, uh, um, you know, blind or not, I, uh, you know, um, girls liked the guy who had a six pack. So it was, uh, you know, so I, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I leveled the playing field a bit with that, and. Um, so, and then, um, uh, you know, college was, you know, the college was kind of the game changer for me when all of a sudden I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I got engaged as a young man. I met the, uh, the woman of my dreams who I'm still married to today. Um, she was married prior to me and had two beautiful girls. And since I was told that I was uh, going to lose my eyesight uh, or uh, that, um, uh, any of my children would uh, also lose their eyesight. I decided I didn't need to have kids of my own. And so when I met uh, my wife and her two beautiful girls, I did the all in card and uh, adopted uh, them. And uh, uh, it's been, you know, exactly what it was meant to be. However, uh, knowing that I was uh, getting married to a ready made family in college, um, I had uh, an access teacher, a computer access teacher, who knew that I had some some relatively solid aptitudes when it came to technology. And they mentioned a computer training for people with disabilities program at the Community College of Denver, uh, which was an IBM sponsored, uh, grant sponsored program with four community colleges across the country. 
uh, CCD being one of them, and it was shortly after Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. And so uh, this was IBM's way of getting uh, people with disability into technology. And so I uh, tested through that, um, had all the appropriate aptitudes. However, I still didn't know what programming was, and so I asked my access teacher, I'm like, so what is, uh, what is computer programming and how much does it pay? I said, I'm about to get married with two kids. So, you know, and so she, uh, she assured me that I would get paid uh, a lot more than what I was getting paid at um, uh, what was it? it was uh, Builder Square, which is the predecessor to the uh, Home Depots and Lowe's of today. Um, I was making 4.75 an hour at that <laughs> back in the uh, early 90s, and so I uh, went to school to become a computer programmer and graduated in 1995 uh, with a uh, certificate in application programming. That was my kind of entree into um, technology. Nice. It's a very important question to ask. What does it pay? Yeah. Exactly. It was all about it was all about the uh, the Benjamins at that time. So uh, with uh, two uh, um, two additional miles to feed and, and everything, so I uh, mm -hmm. it was it was okay that I could do it. But uh, what did it pay? <laughs> so in '95, this was this was a few years before everything kind of exploded, and, and Windows '95 changed the world. So, what were you? Um, what what was your first your first gig out of the uh, out of the program? It was actually uh, so I, I did a short stint with a with an HMO um, down in the tech center. Um, uh, so the kind of the good news is in the mid '90s, it was, it was there was this rumbling of this a major event that was looming called Y2K, and if you could spell Y2K and COBOL all at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, you were almost guaranteed a gig within technology. So it was kind of that first you know, boom uh, within technology. We've had a few booms and busts, obviously. Uh, however, uh, so I was at HMO for just about eight months. The commute was uh, was crazy. There was way before the light rail down the tech center. So it was, uh, you know, three buses. Um, it was a horrible commute. So uh, I had, had some, uh, some friends that were at U.S. West. So this was... Um, Back in the uh, Ma Bell. This was a while Yeah, back. so way back in the day. <laughs> yep. So uh, before CenturyLink, before Quest, it was U.S. West. And so I had some friends that were uh, downtown, and they got me an interview. And so I, uh, that's really where the bulk of my nearly 20 years in technology came from was in uh, telecommunications. So, and it was, um, it was, uh, I started out as a, uh, a COBOL mainframe developer on 3270, uh, um, emulators and and um, then uh, moved uh, US West Wireless started to get built out in the late 90s and so I moved over to that team which was a lot of fun because that was my um, that was my entree and my, that was the predecessor to me getting into uh, you know Cisco networking and everything which was a lot of fun that was the mid 2000s uh, when VoIP started getting crazy and then um, and in uh, you know my uh, nearly 20-year career at uh, Level Three Communications as a senior voice engineer, so I still lovingly call myself a telecom nerd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 20 years in uh, in telecom—that's amazing, Mike. So, being visually impaired, how do you use technology, and how do you how does it work in your mind? Can you explain that? You know, it's interesting because you know I had some sight, but I used the screen reading modalities you know, to have it read it off to me. And, you know, a lot of if-else statements, that sort of thing, I would memorize, and I still do, I still have the, uh, the ability to really kind of memorize large amounts of text and kind of freakishly quick. However, you know, it's one of those, you know, we're all, we're all born with uh, kind of some talents and then we uh, cultivate them, uh, hopefully. And mm -hmm. I think uh, early on what I realized is for, uh, especially technology, it, you know, it's like, mm, you know, all the CLI, all the uh, command line interface uh, environments and that sort of thing, you know, it's just, you know, obviously it started with DOS and, you know, it's still, you know, a lot of the uh, frameworks that are out there have the CLI environments and they, they're very conducive to kind of how I, you know, navigate, memorize, and, and then code is just a, um, an offshoot of that ability of just being able to say, oh, well, you know, I want, I want the, you know, program to be able to, you know, consume, you know, these inputs, you know, process these data points and spit out these, you know, outputs, you know, so my brain kind of 
naturally thinks of kind of steps that way and and then of course you know programming language is just uh, it, it it's kind of a natural it's natural if you've got a brain that kind of thinks in those steps so and then it's just you know our environments uh, accessible right like uh, from a screen reader perspective and um you know so, some are better than others but uh, that's you know really the biggest challenge i've had over my career is just making sure that i'm able to overcome the very real visual obstacles that I've had to encounter. Mm -hmm. How's technology progressed throughout the years in terms of like the screen readers and the, the accessible technologies? They've gotten much better. And there's such a push now from, it was starting with Apple, you know, first and foremost, like they, they've built their free, uh, you know, you buy uh, you know, an Apple device, you know, whether it's an iMac, iPhone, iPad, iPod, they make sure they're, their technologies are innately accessible, and they've done that for the hearing impaired deaf community, from TTY to high contrast for people who are just vision impaired, or and or the voiceover technologies, which is the uh, innate screen reader technologies within the um, the Apple family. So they they've been really cool. There have been paid for screen reader technologies um, that have been out for uh, about 30 years now too, and they've gotten better over the years and they've generally been really good with kind of the windows platforms and then as of recent uh, microsoft has made a huge push to actually make sure that they've got a free uh, screen reader technology as well called narrator on their platforms uh and then of course then you got the google so google has you know they they've invested heavily into an open source screen reader technology and made sure that their entire suite of products work innately with this open source, which of course it's Google source court. They're going to be huge fans of the open source, um, mm -hmm. you know, frameworks that are out there. So uh, there is um, really a wide array of these accessible technologies that are available out there. And, um, and a lot of them, cost uh nothing at this point in time which is amazing mm -hmm. so coming from from uh northeast ohio not knowing what your future looks like it sounds like you've had a very successful run at, uh, at the technology industry after level three what was your next foray you know i was getting into my 40s and i was pretty good in technology i was um I was doing pretty good uh you know kind of in my corporate career however i was I always knew that uh, there was a like a higher calling for me, and not to get too spiritual. However, I do look at it as a higher calling. I uh, started doing some due diligence, wondering why I was the token blind guy out there, Trapper. And um, you know, it's <laughs> worked with some pretty big companies, and I was, you know, um, generally the token blind guy. And so I uh, started doing some due diligence, as a good engineer should. I just realized like there really is an epidemic of unemployment within the blind visually impaired community bvi uh in the greater pwd people with disabilities community it's just an epidemic and i um started doing some due diligence i actually started writing up the the business case while i was still you know uh finishing up my stint there at uh, level three communications i was uh, doing some skip levels with some of the executives there at level three, showcasing, you know, my my overall idea. Uh, they were very encouraged by, you know, what I was attempting to put together. And uh, they told me to give it a shot, which is fantastic. It was, you know, great advice. And so in uh, 20, oh my gosh, it's, uh, gosh, in 20, 2012, I guess now. Yeah, so 2012, uh, fourth quarter. I took the plunge, uh, left a six-figure income. Uh, uh, at that time, my wife and I, <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, we found out we're having our own. Um, his eyes are perfect, but uh, we, uh, we ended up having our uh, kind of our new family all over. My girls were graduating high school at that time, and so we had a small child at home, and I took the plunge, left a six-figure income to start BIT, which uh, you might appreciate being a techie yourself. I took the binary bit, the zero and one, and created the acronym, Blind Institute of Technology. Uh, BIT. Um, yeah. with <laughs> BIT. So, uh, so technology being the greatest mitigator for all of humanity, from the Wright brothers to the pencil, 
Uh, I wanted an organization that was solely focused on making an impact with this unemployment epidemic within the BVI and people with disabilities community. And we're, um, you know, we're five years strong now. We've kind of made it through those early years of, you know, um, actively developing your your product and your services and, you know, your marketing and everything else. And, um, you know, we're we're far from, you know, uh, completely flush with cash. However, we're you know, humbled with the uh, the impact we've been uh, that we've made and the uh, the partners that we have out there in uh, in corporate America, which is really exciting. I'm sure you experienced a lot of discrimination or a lot of question, you know, people with questions about your ability to do the engineering jobs that you did. So that probably gives you a lot different, or that probably gives you a perspective on it that um, employers that you approach now may not have. So, how do you educate employers that? that, um, you know, BVI people are just as capable as anybody else in the technology field? It's a, it's a great question. So, um, you know, I use my career as, um, you know, a level of credibility. However, really, I start with, and it's shifted over the last few years of learning how to, I mean, it sounds like I'm in human trafficking. Uh, however, at the end of the day, I sell blind people. Right, so that is human uh, trafficking, kinda, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, so uh, it's you know it's kind of like Sixth Sense, the Bruce Willis movie. I see dead people, I sell blind people. Right, so it's what I do, and I'm uh, uh, super proud to be part of this uh, this effort and the impact that we've made. Uh, however, again, I start when I go to you know one of our corporate partners, which um, been incredibly uh, vocal and and supportive, uh, like a Davida. You know, I go to an Alan Cullop, who's the CIO for DaVita, and, you know, I talk to them about, you know, some of their challenges, right? And uh, sometimes their challenges are just, you know, because technology is so hot, how do they keep talent, right? So, you know, you can't, uh, you know, just keep pouring money into, uh, you know, more and more salaries. So uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge for organizations, too. So, I go and I talk to them about the value proposition that uh, blind, visually impaired, and people with disabilities, we don't job hop. We don't get jobs. So I start with, you know, what are their needs of an organization and making sure that I'm speaking their language. However, still, at the end of the day, I have to make sure that they understand that, okay, how, how does a blind, visually impaired person uh, or a person with a disability, how do they overcome these these obstacles. Mm -hmm. And so we make sure that we educate them on what accessible technology means, what does it look like, how is it implemented, how is it supported, uh, because they have a lot of experts on on staff. Let's say, you know, they know DevOps, they know cybersecurity, they know uh, data warehouse and big data, they know all these different um, you know, verticals within technology. However, uh, they do not have an accessible technology expert on staff just not what they do. Uh, so we are there as a resource to make sure that they, they know that they've got a true partner uh, to support their needs, uh, you know, when they bring on one of our teammates. Mm -hmm. if, you're in, if you're in human trafficking, obviously you've got to match people to, to employers. So how do you find blind and visually impaired people who <laughs> want to give it a shot? Here's one of my canned jokes that I use. So how do how, how do you find your blind people anyway? So I go to the Walmart for blind people, of course. Um, so uh, seriously, though, I get, um, you know, if you do a Google search on, um, you know, employment organizations or uh, organizations who support employment for blind, visually impaired, uh, there's a really short list. And the good news is BIT is right at, almost right at the top of that Google uh, SEO, which is phenomenal. Um, and so we actually have blind, visually impaired people. And when I say globally, I mean globally, from Iraq to the Philippines, from India, South America, um, Moldova, like, I mean, just all over the globe who have reached out to us. Um, very, very talented individuals um, who, you know, we're, we're blind, visually impaired. We're overcoming the academic challenges, right? So we're going and getting our two and four year degree. Uh, however, when you go out there and you think that you're, oh gosh, I'm a, I've got my MBA, right? Like, so, um, here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. Like you can, you show up with a cane or a guide dog, 
um, or maybe you're maybe you're partially sighted and you know you just um, you got vision uh, like some some do where you see um, only peripheral so you have no central vision but you don't see poorly enough where you use the cane and so they use a technique called they fake it so they'll put their blind spot generally on somebody's face but they miss out on some of the nuances of kind of you know handshaking and that sort of thing so because interviews are so competitive that um, you know whether you have a cane or a guide dog or you just have one of those nuances and you miss one of those subtle things within an interview it um, it's so competitive out there, like that's what weeds you out. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily consider it overt discrimination. I really don't because, you know, you only have a few minutes during an interview to really make that positive impression um, that it just takes a little bit for you for uh, an interviewer to say, yeah, I don't, you know, I, no, it wasn't the eyesight. I just, I, I just don't know, right? Um, so we, BIT, we, we're out there and we help uh, hire, we help teams. Uh, whether it's at Tavita or Aetna or any one of our uh, numerous uh, partners, like we, we educate them on like, okay, so if you've never interviewed somebody with a, you know, visual impairment, you know, here's kind of what to expect. So we, mm -hmm. we help educate these in, entire environments. So they're more prepared, you know, so for the eventuality of getting that interview E that comes in who, you know, again, might be blind, visually impaired, a partial sighted person, whatever that looks like, somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who's deaf, hearing impaired, like it's okay, right? As long as they have the skills, you just got to educate the person who's interviewing uh, what to expect from that interviewer. Yeah, that's a really good point because you know so many of our of our first impressions are formed based off of what we see day to day. Um, but if you've got a, yep. if you've got somebody with a disability, while they may have all the all the qualifications and capabilities that that the next candidate would have, when you go to interview them they may not check all the boxes that you would expect somebody else to have. So you would, you could inadvertently disqualify, qualify talent because you had a perception of how, how they should interview or what a traditional interview looks like. So I think that's really cool that that's kind of an additional way to be an advocate, right? Go out there and say, this person is just as, as qualified as, as the other person, but you know, they may do these things differently and, and that doesn't detract from their capabilities. It's just because of how it is. Absolutely. The uh, kind of what we do and how we do it, it's, it's very, very, uh, you know, we, it's, it's an awareness campaign. Uh, we educate. And um, it's been, it's, it's a lot of fun now, though, because we have so many, you know, just true willing partners. Uh, Oppenheimer Funds is another very public partnership that we have that, uh, you know, literally from, from soup to nuts, from the onboarding process through the training they do, they go through intensive training uh, because it's the it's financial services so you know first they they're looking for skills however next they got to make sure that they get some of those you know after they they're assured that they got the soft skills and some of the more academic skills they got to get very industry specific skills so we made sure that their training environment and the the staff that does their training are all ready for, you know, like, okay, so this, this, it looks a little different. That's all it is. However, again, if you've never, you know, spent time in and around somebody with a vision impairment, you know, you're just not, you're not used to it. So, um, so we have some very, very public partnerships with organizations who are really bought into this concept of diversity and inclusion to include people with disabilities. It's, um, it's been an amazing ride and, and the talent that we're, uh, the talent that we're able to give their teams is absolutely uh, adding to their bottom line and culture. So how big is the BIT right now in terms of like revenue or place? I don't know if you want to get into like revenue dollars, but in terms of, of people that you've placed and, and any metrics like that? No, happy to share it. Uh, so the good news is we are a nonprofit. So we are literally owned by the taxpayers. So I'm, you know, uh, you know, all of our information is very public out there anyway, which is really exciting. However, uh, you know, we've we've been around since 2013, uh, February of 2013. Um, uh, 2013, we uh, really only had, gosh, what, what did we, what, I think we ended up with one placement. We ended up with one placement. And we, we act, uh, so our business model is we act, we are a nonprofit staffing agency. 
So we'll sign direct placement agreements and master service agreements and, and statement of works with organizations like DaVita and Aetna and Oppenheimer Funds and so many others now, and uh, they will pay us for our talented individuals. So, so we had one placement. However, what that was what was incredible about that one placement, like that that started to give us that hope of saying, oh, okay, so there's a demand out there. However, you, my cash, you need to get better at selling this. Mm -hmm. And so I, I worked very diligent, diligently at that. 2014 is actually when things started to, you know, I started to, um, I always say I'm a little slow, <laughs> and, uh, but I, uh, I'm, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, tenacious and I'm, I'm, I work uh, very uh, deliberately. And uh, so 2014, I went to the Colorado Technology Association sea level at mile high. And um, I, I still to this day when I just went to my, uh, my, my last uh, or the, the sea level event again this uh, last week. And um, I'm pretty sure I'm still the only blind sail guy here. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of stick out, uh, pun intended. Um, but I met Alan Cullop, the CIO for DeVita, as we talked about, and um, you know, told them about what we're doing and, and uh, how we're bringing a diverse set of talent to, you know, to bear. And um, he was all over it. Like, he reached out to me immediately. Uh, I'm sure I'm one of the only sales guys that actually get to call back from executives from networking events like that. Um, and within weeks, we were, they were, DeVita was interviewing our candidates. And just a couple of months later, uh, we got our first big hire at DeVita, which was kind of in the Fortune 200 space. And also about that time, we uh, got two other placements at uh, Aetna. And because of that, we ended up, uh, because of just three placements, we ended up getting a front page of uh, the Denver Post um, because the bar has been set so epically low for, you know, blind, visually impaired that you get a few of them placed in big, uh, big names like that. All of a sudden, it's it's a page top 25 periodical worthy, so mm -hmm. which is exciting. And, um, you know, so uh, so 2013, we got one placement. 2014, uh, I think we bounced that up to, gosh, I want to think, uh, like 12 or 13 placements. And then, let's see, 15 and 16, we were right at 15 a year. And then uh, last year, uh, which was our biggest year, obviously, uh, we have 34 placements, and that includes six other states across the union, which is really, really exciting. So um, so we continue to get lots of placements, uh, which, of course, is increasing our revenue and uh, our capacity to uh, you know, work with uh, more and more organizations. That's a really interesting story. So how many people do you have currently placed, and what kind of jobs are they doing within, uh, within technology? So we're uh, so the the good well kind of not, the good news uh, just kind of the way things are evolving. So we have blind vision impaired people that reach out to us from all sorts of different skill levels, and uh, so we've got uh, so currently so we act again as a as a, a staff augmentation firm. So we have uh, eight people out there in the field right now with. Uh, um, five different uh, individual organizations, and they're, uh, they range from Salesforce admins to, um, uh, to quality assurance engineers uh, to contact center, and uh, let me think here, and um, one designer uh, and one developer. So there are literally, you know, uh, multiple technical and multiple you know, uh, from contact centers, so they're all across the board, but as blind, vision impaired, and people with disabilities come to us, and whatever skills they have, our goal is to go out there and find an organization who has really bought into uh, diversity diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. So so we don't know, so even though that I'm uh, all about technology, um, I make sure that if uh, people that come to us with other, you know, skills other than technology, it's my job to go out there and create the relationships to get them employed. It sounds like you're no stranger to the media either. I know that when I was doing a little uh, a little bit of homework on BIT and, and about yourself, ran into multi, or, you know, I, I came across multiple um, Denver Business Journal articles or you know Channel Nine, Channel Four. Is that is that a channel? One of the channels. <laughs> um, yeah, was, uh, actually, we had one of each. We were on. Uh, uh, so Jim Beneman did a uh, did a um, 
that was March. Let me think here. March of 16. We were on Channel 4. So, yeah, it's been – so we were in Network World, which is an, obviously an international IT periodical. That was June of 15. Uh, front page Denver Post of July of 15. Uh, we won the um, APEX Award uh, for the Colorado Technology Association in November of 15. So therefore, we were also in the Denver Business Journal um, that same month because of the award. Um, let's see here. Then in 16, I was honored by the Colorado State Senate. Senator Newell brought me onto the state Senate the, the state Senate floor to give me a tribute. Um, that month uh, in March as well, I was. That's when we did the. Uh, it was 16. We did the uh, uh, Jim Beneman News Four. Uh, in 16 in August, we were the front page of the um, the uh, Denver Post business section, Sunday edition, most viewed section. Is there? Sunday edition, and uh, because of our partnership with uh, Uber, uh, it was very public. Um, we made the front page of the Denver business section, or the Denver Post business section. And then, um, let's see, 17 was honored in January uh, for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Business Award, which was um, a, such an icon to me, and I'm flattered and humbled, and I still haven't earned that award. And then, um, Gosh, I'm thinking. Oh, and then I, then I was honored with an Executive Director of the Year Award with Governor Hickenlooper in uh, November of 17. And um, God, it sounds like I'm being braggadocious, but I, I, I again, I'm a data you, guy. You can keep um, going, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, um, we were just on Channel 9's uh, Colorado and Company in January. So, you know, the, um, you know, I'm, I'm humbled by it all. But I go back to. Uh, you know, the bar has been set so epically low, Trapper, for uh, blind, visually impaired, and the uh, greater people with disabilities community that if you, you know, you do a few kind of cool things, it's, you know, it's newsworthy or it's award-winning worthy. And not that I'm not humbled by it and not that I'm not, you know, flattered by it all. However, again, I, I still don't feel like I've earned it. I, you know, uh, regardless of how many placements we've helped facilitate regardless of, um, you know, any of that. I, I'm, you know, I, I still uh, operate like I haven't done crap yet because um, there's so much more to do. Mike, it sounds like you've done a lot of really interesting things just in these short five years, right? Um, what does the future of BIT look like? Well, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm pretty excited about uh I'm pretty bullish. Uh, that's my personality in general. I'm a, I'm a pretty bullish guy, but we're, you know, we're currently working on um, uh, one of the cool projects that I feel like is uh, um, uh, so we're doing a uh, uh, private, public, nonprofit partnership with uh, University of Denver Ritchie School of Engineering. I submitted a project um, to them in uh, uh, August of last year, so 2017. Um, uh, the project is called Running Blind, and um, I've got um, five interdisciplinary set of engineering students. They're all in their senior year, and uh, they, uh, they have to do a collaborative project, and you get to submit projects. And uh, so the requirements were very, very simple. Um, invent uh, wearable IoT, Internet of Thing devices. Um, geofence or put an electronic grid around a 400 meter track and uh, allow the technology to enable a blind person, i.e. me, uh, to start with, I'll be the guinea pig, to safely and independently run this track. So uh, one of the things that, um, you know, that I long for the most as a blind uh, athlete is independence, just for me to be able to go out and work out on my own. So. Uh, so in May of this year, we will. <laughs> this blind guy is going to be running independently <laughs> and safely around a, a geofence track, which is really cool. Um, Obstacles so, uh, in the so way and everything, continue. right? Uh, so we're going to start with just being able to traverse the track, uh, which is, you know, again safely and independently. But yes, it will get to um, identifying obstacles as well. So, um, so really excited about uh, that endeavor. Uh, we continue to create more and more partnerships 
with uh, organizations uh, such as Google. We are about to become a Google certified training partner uh, to help them with their accessibility training needs, which is really exciting. Um, we continue to saw, um, to create amazing partnerships with uh, you know global companies like Sykes, which uh, they are the world's largest um, contact center at home uh, placement. Uh, so they have literally 10,000 at home um, call center jobs that are out there globally. They are partnering with BIT uh, to literally hire hundreds of blind visually impaired people so they can work from home and still earn an honest nickel. Um, so I'm, I'm bullish about where we're heading, the partnerships that we have, the thought leaders that we are becoming within the technology space. So, um, you know, in my world, it's uh, uh, regardless of me not being able to see the whole light, it's all sunny. Mike, it sounds like the, the future of BIT is incredibly, incredibly exciting. How can people get in contact with you and how can they find out more about, you know, either placing your candidates or letting you traffic in them? <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I make myself incredibly available. Uh, from an email address perspective, it's mike at blindit, blind is an unable to see, blindit.org, mike at blindit.org. And uh, my phone number is 303-995-MIKE. So I make myself incredibly available to uh, corporate partners, to people who are interested and uh, just get in touch with us to be part of an amazing organization that um, is absolutely changing the landscape uh, within corporate culture for people with disabilities. Great. We'll definitely get links to those in all of the show notes. Mike, I really enjoyed talking with you. I know that you know, we met at sea level uh, two years ago, and I was personally very impressed with your, uh, your tenacity in uh, you know, getting the word of, of BIT out there and you know making your voice heard. And I think that you know, I've personally witnessed firsthand your persuasiveness when you when you get in front of these executives and and you make your case for you know BVI and uh, the BIT. So it's a lot of acronyms, but I guess we're in technology, so that's okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Trapper. It was it's been great to get to know you, and I appreciate the uh, the honor of being on your uh, your podcast, my friend. And uh, best Best of luck to you, and I um, uh, look forward to uh, many more uh, successful podcasts, my friend. Make sure to check out the Accessibility Technology Symposium being put on by the Blind Institute. This is held on Thursday, May 10th, and it's an all-day event at the Denver West Marriott in Golden. Net proceeds benefit the Blind Institute of Technology and really helps further the work that Mike and his team can do. Come and learn how to integrate accessibility into your existing product development lifecycle and see how building accessible digital platforms is easier than you think. Make sure to check it out at blindinstituteoftechnology.org. Whether you're a first-time listener or you've been with us since the start, we appreciate your support. Make sure to check out our website at coloradotechcast.com. There you'll find all the other episodes we've recorded with links to show notes and other great content. This is Trapper Little, and I'll catch you on the next episode of Colorado TechCast.